to welcome um, CSU's very own Leon Duan, um, who's going to be speaking to us about Bertini's theorem over finite fields and Frobenius non-classical varieties. Okay, thanks very much, Amy, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to thank all the people here for giving me this chance to introduce our work on Bertini's theorem over finite field and Frobenius non-classical varieties. And before my talk, I want to say that this is a joint work with Shamil Asghali and Kwan Wenlai. Okay, so let's start. So as you already seen that this talk is about the Bertini theorem. For the people who are not familiar with that, let me quickly review that theorem. So take X to be a smooth closed sub variety of Pn over little k. Here we would like to take little k for this moment to be an algebraic closed field. And the theorem of Bertini basically claims that there is at least one hyperplane edge defined over little k such that edge doesn't contain x and the intersection of x and edge are smooth. And in this situation, we would like to say that edge is transverse to x, otherwise we say x, uh, edge is tangent to x. Okay, so this is a statement of Bertini's theorem, but in fact, we can say more. For instance, we can say that for a very general choice of edge, it should be transverse to x. In other words, if we want it to be tangent to x, then we have to choose it very carefully because the tangent condition is in general a closed condition. And in fact, in this theorem, we don't really need a k to be an algebraic closed field because if you read the proof of the theorem, you will realize that even if k is just an arbitrary infinite field, the same statement is still true. So the next question we want to ask is that, okay, then how about everything is over finite field? Do we still have the exactly statement of Bertini's result? And in the following, I would like to give you some weird but interesting example to convince you that in this situation, the Bertini's result doesn't hold sometimes. So in my example, I would like to take the little k to be a finite field fq, and here my q is a power of a prime number p. And for a smooth curve, say, contained in p2 over fq, I would like to call it a space failing curve if every fq point of p2 is also contained in c. Of course, over infinite field, this won't happen, but over finite field, we do have a result from Homa and Kane and 2012. In their result, they show that, okay, over finite field FQ, you can always find a degree Q plus two smooth space failing curve. Now let's take our curve to be one of the Q plus two, uh, degree Q plus two smooth space failing curve. And then, Recall that because we are in P2, so the hyperplanes are exactly the lines divided over FQ. Now let's try to think about their intersection. On one hand, we use Bayesian theorem. Then if we count multiple cities, then there are exactly Q plus two intersection points of C and L. On the other hand, we know that L is divided over FQ, so it means that there are exactly Q plus one FQ points in L. And re remember that we require our curve to be space failing. It means that all of those Q plus one points are also contained in C. So by this observation, we already find out at least Q plus one intersection between C and L. So where is the last one? I would like to say that the last intersection point is also defined over FQ because if it was not, then we can look at the Forbinius conjugate of this point. And if it was not over FQ, then by Forbinius action, we will have some new point, which is also an intersection point of C and L. But if that happened, then we would have more than Q plus two intersection among C and L. That is a contradiction to um, Bayesian theorem. So it means that this can happen. In other words, the last, in 
the last intersection point must be one of the Q plus one FQ point of L. But in that situation, we know that the last intersection point is a double intersection of C and L. In other words, L is tangent to C. And because our L is choosing arbitrarily, it means that our sp space filling curve C has no FQ transverse line in, uh, in P2 over FQ. So I hope that this example can convince you that the, the exactly statement of Bertini theorem does not hold if we, uh, if we are over finite field. Then we are wondering that, okay, is there any way that we can still save Bertini theorem? So far, we know that there are at least two ways to do that. The first way is suggested by Poonen and his paper at 2004. In his paper, he says that, okay, maybe, maybe hyperplanes doesn't do the job. Then how about hypersurface? In other words, what if we allow the degree of H to be any arbitrary integer greater than or equal to one? And in his paper, he showed that if we collect all those hypersurfaces who intersect with X transversely, then that collection has positive density. In other words, he proved that, okay, we have infinitely many hypersurfaces who can intersect, uh, who is defined over FQ and uh, also intersect with X smoothly. Okay, this is Poonen's result, but sometimes we still prefer hyperplanes because geometrically they are of degree one and they are easy to handle in some situation. But we know that maybe we have no chance to find out those transverse hyperplane over the ground field. So in this situation, we have to extend the, our ground field and hope that over some finite extension, we can find out at least one of the transverse hyperplane. And before we move on, I want to say that this idea does work because if we keep extending the ground field, then we will finally reach some fi infinite field. And we know that the Bertini theorem hold for every infinite field. So it means that, okay, over this limit, over this infinite field, we can find out at least one transverse hyperplane to X. And that hyperplane must be defined over some finite extension of the ground field. Okay, it means that over some finite extension, we must be able to find out the first uh, transverse hyperplane to X. But then we may ask, do we know how large we should extend the ground field to guarantee at least one transverse hyperplane over that extension? So this is our main question. And in fact, we are not the first group of people who, who are wondering this question. Before us, Barlico did some research on this question. And in order to introduce his idea, let's think about the dual space of PN. Here, the notation PN star basically means that it is a, a copy of PN, but its point are corresponding to hyperplanes in the original PN. And it, in order to make my life easier, let's assume for this moment that X is a smooth hypersurface. And in that situation, we could also consider some map which is called the Gauss map. Roughly speaking, Gauss map would send every point P in X to the corresponding tangent space of X attached to P. And if we make use of the notation of Pn star, then we know that, okay, this tangent space is a hyperplane. So it is a point in the dual space. And we would like to use X star to denote the image of the Gauss map. It is basically the variety who consists of all the, high, uh, all the tangent, tangent plane, sorry, tangent hyperplane of X. So Barlico's observation is like the following. Suppose, suppose every FQ hyperplane is tangent to X, then if we make use of the definition of dual space, it means that all the FQ point in the dual space is also contained is contained in X star. In other words, 
it means that X star is space failing in the dual space. Okay, then Balico did some research for the dual space, uh, duality, sorry. And he realized that the degree of X star is at most this number. In particular, when the cardinality of the ground field is greater than or equal to this number, then it means that X star cannot be, cannot be space failing. And in that situation, we must be able to find out some transverse hyperplane to X over that FQ. Of course, Balikov's result is much more general than I said, because he doesn't require X to be a hypersurface. But the idea is basically like I introduced. So I love this result very much because you can say that this bond is pretty straightforward and it only depends on the degree and the dimension of X. It is very beautiful. But we can still ask, is Balikov's result sharp enough? And in fact, one of my collaborators, Shamil Asghali, did some research for the curve cases uh, at 2019, he realized that if we go through all the smooth curves, smooth plane curves defined over FQ, then unless the curve is very spatial in the sense that it is forbidden as non-classical, I will introduce the concept later on. But let's say that unless the curve is very spatial, then we can always improve Balikov's result by a factor of D. Okay, before we move on, I want to give you a quick remark. In fact, Ascali's result is the best possible result we can have. This is because even if we assume Q is equal to D minus two, or in other words, if we assume D is equal to Q plus two, then let's recall that our example about space failing curves, then we will immediately realize that in this situation, we do have some examples who has no FQ transverse line. So this means that we can't improve Ascali's result any further. Okay, so this is Ascali's result. And inspired by his result, we are wondering that if we can generalize this result for higher dimensional situations. And in order to introduce our result, let me first introduce some notations. So from now on, we will always assume our X to be a smooth hypersurface defined over FQ and its defining equation is F and the, the degree of F is D. And we will denote by F sub of I to be the corresponding partial derivative of the defining equation. And we will construct a new polynomial which, which we would like to call F10. And you can simply understand F10 as a dot product of the two, ver uh, two vectors like this. And then we will define our X10 as a scheme defined by F10. Okay, with all those notations, we are ready to introduce the concept of forbidden classical and forbidden non-classical. Okay, so suppose we have a smooth uh, hypersurface X, then X is called forbidden classical if X is not a subscheme of X, X10. In other words, if the defining equation F doesn't divide F10. Otherwise, if F divides F10, we say it is a forbidden non-classical. Well, this is a definition, but the definition looks weird at the first glance. So let me quickly introduce the idea behind all the definition. So suppose we have a variety X. We can choose a random point P in this variety. We can write down its coordinate like this. And then we can consider the forbidden action of phi attached to this point. As we know that the forbidden action always raise the power of the coordinate of P. So phi of P is like this. And then we can also look at the tangent space attached to P. It is not hard to realize that the tangent space is just the orthogonal space to the, to the vector given by the partial derivative of defining equation. And with these two notations, and if you recall the way we define F10, 
you will immediately say that, okay, when X is for being non-classical, it means for every point P in this variety, the forbidden action of this point is contained in the tangent space of the original point P. This is a very strong restriction because it is restriction for every point in this variety. So we can say that for a very general choice of smooth hypersurface, it should be forbidden classical. Okay, so with this definition, we are ready to introduce our first main result. So in our theorem, we prove that when X is a degree D smooth Fobinian's classical hypersurface in Pn, then we can guarantee that there is an FQ transverse line as long as Q is greater than or equal to Cn times D. Here, Cn is a constant only depends on the dimension of F of Pn, and D is the degree of the variety. I would like to say that this is a generalization of Ascali's result because Ascali's result is basically the dimension one situation of our main theorem. Uh, but I'm not going to say this is a generalization of Balikov's result because Balikov cares about the hyper planes, but we focus on transverse lines. Okay. So this is a statement of our, our result. And in the following few minutes, I would like to quickly introduce the idea behind all the proof. And in fact, our proof is pretty straightforward. This is because we are over finite field. It means that we can almost count everything. For instance, on one hand, it's, it's not hard to count the number of lines divided over FQ in Pn because th this set is parameterized by the grass many set over FQ. On the other hand, suppose we find a way to, to count the number of FQ tangent lines to X, and then we can do comparison. And suppose we find out that there are fewer FQ tangent lines compared with the total number of lines in Pn, then we win. Okay, so the question is, how do we really count the FQ tangent lines to X? In order to do that, we classify those tangent lines into two types. The first type is called the rational tangent lines. By definition, a line is a rational tangent line if it is the first uh, tangent line, of course. And secondly, at least one of its tangency point is defined over FQ. On the other hand, if we have an FQ point of X, then we can try to count how many lines are taking this exact point as a tangency point. And in fact, this it is not hard to say that there are exactly this number of distinct rational tangent line taking P as its tangency point. And it means that And um, I think I, I, I guess I have a question for Amy. Amy asks that if X is smooth, it looks like X1, uh, X10 should be the entire space. Um, I would like to say probably not. Um, I guess sometimes, yeah, sometimes you are right that uh, sometimes for some spatial situation, F10 could be the zero polynomial. In that situation, F X10 is the entire space. But in general, I mean, in for general choice of for being a non-classical hypersurface, F10 doesn't vanish. And in that situation, maybe X10 is not the entire space. Okay, so my question is more like, does it make sense to do anything with non-smooth hypersurfaces, or like, can do you do you have to keep that assumption? I think this is a very good question. I think the only reason we want X to be smooth just because we when we are thinking about the Gauss map, we hope it to be a we hope it to be a morphism. 
and we hope it to be a finite morphism. And we make use of this condition in our proof. So this is the only reason we hope X to be smooth. But of course, everything can be generalized to non-smooth varieties. And we are also very curious about the result for non-smooth case. Thanks for asking this interesting question. Okay, so, um, okay, let's move on. Um, so as we know that every, for every FQ point, we have, sorry, we have this many FQ rational tangent line passing through it. And if we know the uh, estimation of FQ point in X, then we can immediately have a bound for the total number of rational tangent lines. And here we use a result of Homa Kane to bound the FQ to bound the number of FQ, uh, FQ points of X. So immediately we have a estimation of the upper bound for the rational tangent line. And you can do a quick comparison between the leading terms of this, of the bound for rational tangent line and the, and the total number of FQ, sorry, sorry. And the total number of FQ lines in PN, you will see that when Q is greater than or equal to D, then we have a hope to win, right? So, but this is only the rational tangent line part. Then we still have to deal with the second type of lines. They are called the spatial tangent lines. In fact, a line is called a spatial tangent line. It means that this line itself is divided over FQ and it is tangent to X, but none of its tangency point is divided over FQ. So by definition, if P, is the geometric point of X, which is also a spatial tangent point of a spatial tangent line, then we know that the forbidden conjugation of P are also the spatial tangency point of a spatial tangent line. And this observation basically tells us that if we want to count the spatial tangent lines, then we can try to estimate the number of spatial tangency point and multiply that number by one half then we can get an estimation of spatial tangent lines. So this reduces the question to finding out those spatial tangency points. How do we really do that? We do this by the following observations. The first observation is that suppose P is a spatial tangency point of a spatial tangent line L, then as we explained above, phi P is another spatial tangent point in L. But L itself as a, a tangent line, it is contained in the tangent point, a tangency space of X attached to P. So it means that phi P is contained in TP of X. What does this mean? If you still remember the definition of X10, you will realize that this is exactly saying that P itself is contained in the new variety X10. Okay. The second observation is basically according to our condition that we assume that the line is divided over the ground field, so it is stable under the forbidden action. And it means that all the forbidden conjugate of a spatial tangency point are all contained in the same line. So in other words, they are collinear. This implies that if we take Vn to be the union of all the FQ lines in Pn, then every spatial tangency point should be contained in Vn. Okay, now if we want to find out a spatial tangent point, then we know that that point has to be contained in X because it's, it's a tangency point of X. And that point has to be also contained in F, X10 and it is also contained in Vn. So it means that those spatial tangents point must be contained in the triple intersection. And if we use Bayesian theorem and count the degree of the triple intersection carefully, then we have a immediate bound for the size of the set of spatial tangent lines. Now, it's very good that we have a bound for the Russian tangent line set and also have a bound for the spatial line tangent line set. And if we take the summation of the two bounds and compare that with the total number of 
FQ lines in PN will get a proof of our, of our main theorem. And before we move on, I want to quickly remark that the reason we want our X to be Frobenius classical is because when we are using Bayesian theorem and uh, when we were trying to count the degree, we do hope that the intersection of X and X10 has less dimension compared with X. In other words, we don't want X to be contained in X10. So that's why we need Frobenius classical condition. However, even if we don't require that condition, we can still deduce some bound to guarantee an FQ transverse line as long as X is reduced. So we don't even need X to be smooth in this situation. But this bound compared with the bound in our first theorem is, uh, uh, is a little bit worse than that bound. So this is what we can say for FQ transverse line. Then after we have this result, we start to think about that, okay, can we also get a bound to guarantee FQ transverse two-dimensional subspace or maybe three-dimensional and uh, so on. And in fact, we can deduce a very quick bound from particles result. If you still record, if you still remember particles result, you can say that when Q is greater than or equal to this number, you can always find an FQ transverse hyperplane to X. And if we are curious about uh, FQ transverse R plane, by the terminology R plane, I mean it is a R dimensional subspace which is defined over FQ. So suppose you are curious about the uh, FQ transverse R plane, you can think about it as an intersection of a sequence of, of hyperplanes. And if you inductively use Balikas result, you can prove that no matter what R is, as long as it is between zero and uh, minus one, if Q is greater than or equal to this number, you can always find out at least one transverse R plane divided over FQ. However, if you compare that, that bound with our bound for r equal to one case, maybe you want to assume for being this classical condition at this moment. But, but if you do the comparison, you will see that there is a huge difference between this bound, these two bounds. And this difference basically implies that for other number r, which are greater than one, there should also be some room to improve this bound. So this is what we are going to do next, but the question is how do we really do that? So our idea is like the following. Now, suppose we have a transverse, transverse FQ line, then can we based on this line construct a transverse plane? And uh, if we have our transverse plane, then we can we based on this plane to construct some transverse three-dimensional subspace. In general, our question is, suppose we already have a transverse R plane, which is denoted by HR, then can we find a R plus one plane based on HR? And it, it turns out that we find a way to do this construction and our strategy is still counting everything. So on one hand, we can try to count all the uh, count the total number of R plus one plane containing H. On the other hand, we can try to exclude those bad ones. And suppose after the exclusion, we still have some leftover R plus one planes, then they must be what we are looking for, right? So let me quickly tell you what do I mean by bad. So take HR plus one to be a R plus one plane containing HR, then sometimes HR plus one is tangent to X. Then we definitely don't like this situation. So in this case, we say HR plus one is bad. But sometimes even if HR plus one is transverse to X, we still don't like it. 
because we want to do induction. It means that after finding out a transverse HR plus one, we still want to find out a transverse HR plus two. But in some situation, for a transverse HR plus one, every higher dimensional subspace containing it is, is tangent to X. In that situation, there's no hope for us to find out a transverse HR plus two. So in that situation, we still don't like this HR plus one. We still say it is bad. So as a conclusion, we would like to call uh, our plan HR very transverse to X if first it is transverse to X and secondly, at least one of the higher dimensional subspace containing HR is also transverse to X. Here, please note that when I say R plus one subspace, I'm not assuming it is defined over the ground field. Okay, so this is definition. And with, with this definition, we know what we want to exclude. First, we want to exclude those tangent HR plus one. And secondly, we want to exclude those one who are transverse, but not very transverse. So let's first try to estimate those transverse, but not very transverse HR plus one. And in order to do that, I will, I will use the notation H star to denote the set of hyperplanes in Pn, which contains the given, high, uh, given subspace H. And please note that this is a set of hyperplanes, so it is a subset of the due space of Pn. And it, now let's assume our HR is good enough in the sense that it is very transverse. But let's assume that HR plus one is transverse but not very transverse, then you can deduce from this condition that it means that every hyperplane contain, containing HR plus one is tangent to X. In other words, if we make use of the star notation, it means that the set HR plus one star is contained in the Gauss image of X. Recall that the Gauss image is basically the, the set of the, all the tangent space of X. On the other hand, we know that HR is a linear section of HR plus one. And if we make use of the star notation, we know that HR plus one is a hyperplane section of HR star. So if we combine these two conditions, then we know that HR plus one is a degree one component of this intersection. And by the Balikas result, we know that the degree of this intersection is no greater than this number. It means that in the intersection, there are at most that many HR plus one as degree one component. In other words, there are exactly the same number. There are at most this number of HR plus one who are transverse but not very transverse to X. Okay. So this is an estimation of transverse, but not very transverse HR plus one. And in addition to that, we still need to know how many HR plus one might be tangent to X. And in order to do the counting, we would like to assume that HR, HR is defined by the intersection of hyperplane given by the last few variables of X. And this, we can always do this up to a PGLN action. So recall that our HR plus one is a space containing both HR and some other point P away from HR. In particular, if our HR plus one is tangent to X, we can even assume this point P is a tangency point attached to X. And then if you translate the tangent condition, then you will see that this is exactly saying that the, the tangency point P is contained in X and uh, all the hyperplane defined by the first R partial derivative of the defining equation of X. In addition to that, still we assume that HR plus one is defined over FQ. It means that it is stable under the forbidden action. In other words, if we replace P with its forbidden conjugate, 
we still get the same spanning space. And we managed to find a variety ZR, which consists of all the point P satisfy this condition. Unfortunately, I don't have enough room to write down the defining equation of ZR, but we know its geometry and especially we know its degree. And you can see that if we want to count the tangent at R plus one, then we are reduced to counting the tangency, tangency point P. And based on our observation, we know that P must be contained in this total intersection. And it means that if we have a way to count the degree of this total intersection, we may have a estimation of the bound of the tangent HR plus one place. And then we get the estimation for the upper bound for both tangent HR plus one and the set of transverse but not very transverse HR plus one. And if we take the summation, of this two estimation and compare with that number with the total number of HR plus one containing HR, we get to our second major result. And our second major result is regarding to tr very transverse R plane to a given smooth hypersurface X. And we can prove that if R is uh, any integer between zero and a minus one, as long as Q is greater than or equal to this number, we can guarantee that there is a very transverse R plan to X. And because that, high, uh, that R plan is very transverse, it is obvious transverse. So this time we would like to say that we really generalize Barlick's result because his result is only Relate to transverse hyperplane, but now we have a nice bound for airway transverse R plane. So this is the second result I want to introduce. It looks like I still have a few minutes. So in the following, I would like to talk about our current project. So currently, we are trying to study the forbiddenness non-classical varieties. So as a quick Reminder, let's, remind, let's recall that when we have a variety X, then we can define X10 in this way. In particular, we say that X is forbiddenness non classical if the defining equation of X divides F10. And the forbiddenness non classical variety is of interest by itself, but one of our motivations of studying this kind of variety is because we have already improved Barlick's result for forbiddenness classical varieties. And we are wondering what happened for forbiddenness non-classical varieties. Can we always find an FQ transverse hyperplane to those non-classical varieties? And when we start to, start to learn this kind of variety, we find out that this question is in fact non-trivial. And uh, one of the reason for it to be non-trivial is because we don't know much information about this kind of varieties. For instance, although we keep talking for being a non-classical variety for a while, but do we have a do we have a concrete example of this kind of varieties? So in the following, let me give you at least a few examples to convince you that there are some kind of varieties who are for being non-classical. So think about the variety defined by this diagonal polynomial. And here, please note that we assume our ground field to be FQ squared instead of FQ. Then use the way we introduced to construct F10, and it is this polynomial. And you can immediately say that F10 in this case is nothing but the Q's power of defining equation of X. And in this situation, it's obvious that f divides f10. And then we may ask, okay, can we find a f, uh, can we find a transverse hyperplane divided over the ground field? And the answer is obvious, yes, because you can look at xn equal to zero, and this hyperplane is a transverse hyperplane divided over the ground field fq squared. 
In addition to this example, we can also construct some other examples of forbidden non-classical variety in the same manner. They are forbidden non-classical over maybe some larger extension of FQ. And you can also immediately say that Xn equals zero is always an obvious transverse hyperplane of those, those examples, no matter where they are defined over. So if we only have those examples, maybe we can make a guess, we, maybe we can make a wide guess like, like maybe no matter what the forbidden non-classical hypersurface we have, we, it looks like we can always find a transverse hyperplane to this variety over its ground field. This is our wide guess, but we don't know whether this is true or not because Beside of this type of example, maybe also beside of the PGR action of those examples, we, it's really hard to find out any other type of example. Although we do have a few other types of example, but we don't know a general way to generalize those examples, to generate those examples. And this makes the study a little bit difficult. However, although we say that we don't know much information about the general forbidden non-classical varieties, but we can say something if we are interested in the curve. So in fact, if C is a smooth forbidden non-classical curve in P2 over FQ, then according to a result of Partini and uh, 1986, we know that the degree of C has to be one mod P. In fact, Partini showed that every, sec every second partial derivative of the defining equation is identically equal to zero. So this is a really strong condition for forbidden non-classical curves. And based on Partini's result, Hefez and Valak did some research at the 1990s, and they basically gave an upper bound and lower bound for the possible degree of the curve. And moreover, they prove that as long as C is forbidden non-classical and smooth, then up to a PGL action, you can always write down the defining equation of C like the following. This is the beautiful result. Basically, it can include all the possible example for forbidden non-classical smooth curves. And in addition to that, they even prove some surprising result for forbidden non-classical curves. You know that the degree of a forbidden non-classical curve could be very high. In other words, the genus of it could be very high. And in that situation, the counting problem for the FQ, problem, for FQ points of C is in general not, not easy, right? But if C is forbidden non-classical over FQ, then they can prove that the total number of FQ points in C can be deduced exactly by this form. Okay, after the work of Hefez and Verlach, there are also some research has been done for the singular forbidden classic, forbidden non classical plane curves. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to introduce them one by one. So this is all we know about forbidden non classical curves, then we may ask that, okay, if we can generalize this result to higher dimensional situation, unfortunately, before our work, not much is even known for forbidden non-classical surface in P3. So we decide to do some work to understand the higher dimensional situations. And the first thing we discover is that if X is a forbidden non-classical hypersurface, then it is it is not reflexive. Here, I'm not going to introduce the definition of reflexive, but what I want to emphasize is that as a conclusion of this, we can deduce that the degree of forbidden non-classical hypersurface is always either zero or one mod t. But if you still remember Partini's result, you will see that for curves, the degree is always one mod p. So, we have a natural question to ask. This question is, can we also exclude the situation that P divides the degree of the forbidden non-classical hypersurface? 
a naive idea to answer the question is, suppose we are lucky, suppose there is a transverse hyperplane to X divided over the ground field, then we can use that hyperplane to cut our variety and get a lower hypersurface, which is also for being non-classical and which is also smooth. And suppose we are even luckier, then we can have more than one hyperplanes. Then we can use those hyperplanes to cut X one by one. And finally, maybe we can reach to a Fobinus non-classical smooth curve in P2. And because we know that the cutting won't change the degree, so it means that if we can use this idea to reduce to plane curve case, then we can exclude the degrees equals zero situation. But in general, we don't know if there is an FQ transverse hyperplane to X because so far the best result is still Balikul's result. And Balikul require Q to be large enough compared with the degree of the Fabinus non-classical variety. And in general, it means that we probably cannot find an FQ transverse hyperplane to X. Uh, over the ground field, at least according to Balikul's result. So our first question, uh, our second question is that if we don't use Balikul's result, can we still prove that there is always at least one FQ transverse hyperplane to X divided over, divided over the ground field? Okay, this is the first discovery of us. And the second thing I want to report is that we also try to study the maximal and the minimal possible degree of a Fobinus non-classical hypersurface in PN. And uh, in fact, using causal complex and uh, combine our result for uh, counting R transverse subspaces, we managed to prove the following result, which is regarding to the possible degree of a Fobinus non-classical hypersurface. Actually, I want to say that our bound should be sharp in the sense that we do have some spatial example who attach either the low, the lower degree, uh, the lower bound, or the upper bound. Okay. In addition to the second result, finally, I want to mention a special case for the Fabinius non-class hypersurface. In some situation. If the defining equation f can be written as a summation of other two polynomials, in particular, these two polynomials don't have any common variable, then in this situation, we say that x is separated. And we manage to prove that if x is separated for Venus non classical hypersurface, then the Gauss map of x has to factor through the for Venus map. In particular, it means that the degree of X has to be equal to one more P. So based on this observation, we may ask that, is that true that every Fobinus non-classical hypersurface up to an uh, action of PGLN over FQ is always separated? We don't know the answer for this question because we don't know many examples of Fabinus non-classical hypersurface. But for all the known example we have, it looks like that this, the answer to this question is always yes. In fact, we can also ask a more general question. Is that true that no matter whether X is separated or not, the Gauss map of X is always factoring through the Fabinus map? And we would like to believe that the answer to this question is also yes, because we test this question to all the examples we know, and we don't have any counter example. But still, this is just our guess. We don't have a proof so far. Okay, I think maybe it's better for me to stop here and I really appreciate your uh, patience. Thanks a lot. Please join me in thanking Leon for the excellent talk. Um, are there any questions for Leon? Actually, um, I have I have one real fast. I think. Um, do you know if the it's like the only example that I know of these kind of weird things is K 
Katz's example in Poonin's paper of a particular hypersurface where, um, and the hypersurface is you have variables xi and yj, xi's and yi's, and the equation is, I don't know, it's xi to the q, yi minus yi to the q, xi, or something like that. And so there you have the two, the two you have two sets of variables that are mixed. Do you know, do you know if you can separate that? as in your last slide? I think this is a really good example. Um, I'd be amazed, if you haven't thought about it before, I'd be shocked if you could sort of do it in real time. I was just kind of curious if you had you know, applied your question to that example. And if not, I can show it to you later. Yeah, I guess maybe I need some time to think about <laughs> if there is a way to separate them. But I really appreciate this this interesting example. I would like to think about that and answer you later on. Would that be fine? No problem. Thanks. Oh, hey, Leon. This is Rachel. Thanks. Um, hey, yeah, Rachel. great talk. You know, uh, one thing that it reminded me a little bit of was some work of Korch Maros. Um, and, and he might be somebody to ask about whether he could know of more examples of these non-classical, non-classical things. So it's not really a question, but more a, a comment. So Korchmaros was really interested in um, maximal curves, and many other people are interested in maximal curves that realize the upper bound and the Hasse-Weil bound mm -hmm. over fq squared. And um, they proved that every maximal curve can be embedded in a Hermitian variety. Um, and, and so the embedding of the curve has degree um, I forget, like Q plus one in the Hermitian variety of degree and Q plus one or something. So I think your X zero one looks a lot like this Hermitian variety of Coach Maros. And so it might be that that would be somebody to ask for other examples about these Frobenius non-classical ones. Cause I know that Coach Maros has looked very, very closely at those Hermitian varieties. I think this is a really Great suggestion, thanks, Rachel. And your suggestion, in fact, remind me one of our result. And if I if I'm understanding your suggestions correctly, that I think when you say the Hermitian uh, variety, it should yeah. some, some it should be something defined in this way. Is that right? Yeah, and and you should definitely share your results with Karchmaros. I mean, and and his colleagues. I mean, I think that they would be really interested. I, I would definitely do that. I really appreciate the suggestion. Yeah. Great, are there any other questions? Okay, if not, well, let's go ahead and give Leon another round of applause. And I think, um, this concludes all of the uh, talks for our conference today. Um, if you'd like to hang out and have a little bit more of social time, I think Sarah has a Zoom meeting link posted. Um, so yeah, please join us over there. Everybody. And thank you all for attending. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for a great Thanks. conference. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. In the, in the this, chat. This, this is really great. This, this number <laughs> I guess I should head over to that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to head over there too. <laughs> Cool. I'll just end this meeting then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.